I'm Ed Schultz, hypnotherapist, and I would like to help you become the ideal you, the you that you'd like to be. The way I can help you do this is by using hypnosis. Hypnosis is probably one of the most powerful tools that anyone can use to make changes in their life. Hypnosis can be used to change or improve just about any kind of behavior. One of the reasons for this is that in hypnosis we deal with the subconscious mind, not just the conscious mind. Most people try to make changes with their conscious mind, that part of their mind that's immediately aware of their environment, that takes in information through their five physical senses. But you know that's only a part of your mind. Your subconscious mind is below the surface and is much more powerful. Just like an iceberg, the conscious mind is like the part of the iceberg that's on the surface that you see and it looks pretty big, it looks pretty awesome. But if you look below the surface, you see this tremendously powerful, tremendously large force. That's your subconscious mind. And that's the part of you that we help to change in hypnosis. Now what I'd like you to do is to watch these tutorials that will help you understand what hypnosis is and how it works and how it can be applied to different issues that you might have in your life, things that you want to change, behaviors, thoughts, beliefs, actions in your life that you want to change. So watch these tutorials and learn how hypnosis can help you to become the you that you want to be. Hypnosis can be defined as a heightened state of suggestibility that's brought about through a process of relaxation, concentration, and cooperation. But before we talk too much about hypnosis itself, it's important to understand the human mind. Now, the human mind is composed primarily of two parts, the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. If you think of the mind as being like an iceberg, the tip of the iceberg, which is what you see on the surface, seems to be awesome, it seems to be powerful, and indeed it is. The major function of the conscious mind is to bring in information through the five physical senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell, process that information and respond to it, respond to the environment that you're immediately aware of, to concentrate, to focus, to plan, to act and to react. Now, below the surface, just like with an iceberg, is something that's bigger, much more powerful, much more awesome. That's what's known as the subconscious mind. Now, the subconscious mind has two major functions one of which is to be a repository of all the thoughts, feelings, emotions, ideas, experiences that you've had throughout your entire lifetime. Another function of the subconscious mind is to be in charge of the autonomic functions of the body. Now what we mean by that is functions such as your heartbeat, your respiration, uh, blinking of your eyes, your digestion. All of these functions that are sort of uh, I guess you might say autopilot type functions. Functions that you don't necessarily have to consciously be aware of and think about throughout the day. Because if you did, you wouldn't have time for anything else. For example, blinking is one of those functions that the subconscious mind has control over. It tells you when to blink. If you had to consciously decide when to blink throughout the day, you wouldn't have time to do very much else. Now, the subconscious mind and the conscious mind are developed throughout our entire lifetime. And the subconscious mind, from about age, well, from about birth to around age six or so, is like a tape recorder that's constantly on record. 
It's taking in information uncritically and recording that information. That information, those experiences, could be positive experiences or negative experiences. And they build up a group, a body of associations that are going to be used throughout your entire lifetime. As I said, this is all done uncritically up until about the age of six. So that, for example, if your parents say to you that on Christmas Eve, a big man in a red suit with a white beard comes down the chimney and puts presents under the tree, you believe it because they're bigger than you, older than you, smarter than you, and they're your parents. They're authority figures. So of course you believe what they say. And that's recorded in your subconscious mind, and then throughout your lifetime, you respond to that particular association in various ways throughout your life, depending on what kind of other experiences have come along. And these experiences, as I said, can be positive or negative. For example, if your first experience of a dog was an experience of your neighbor's German Shepherd jumping over the fence, pouncing on you, knocking you down, causing you pain, and biting you, then you have a negative experience in your subconscious mind associated with dog. And because of the emotional impact of that original experience, it's going to stay with you and be firmly rooted in your subconscious mind, so you're going to respond. Whatever you see a dog or anything associated with dogs throughout your entire life, you're going to respond with some kind of primeval response to that image of dog. And it's going to be a negative one. And this is one of the ways that fears and phobias develop by the experiences, the negative experiences that we've had in our childhood. Now, there are also positive experiences, like the experience of Santa Claus. It's one that we enjoy, and even in our adult life, most of us associate Santa Claus with some very pleasant experiences. Another part of the mind that's developed around the age six or after is something that's called the critical mind. Now this is actually a kind of filter between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. It's that part of our mind that begins to question things. Uh, a capacity that we didn't have when we were younger. So that by the time you reach the age of seven or so, you begin to think, well, this big man in a red suit who comes down the chimney, that doesn't seem really to be possible because if somebody is that big, they'd get stuck in the chimney and they'd get all dirty because of all the soot and the ashes in the chimney. And how could one person go around the entire world in one night and give presents to all the children in the world? See, this critical mind, this critical faculty, now begins to take some of those associations that are in the subconscious mind and question them, especially when new information comes into the conscious mind. Once a new experience comes in, or some kind of new experience, new uh, information comes into the conscious mind, it kind of runs an immediate Google search of the subconscious mind and its content and looks for something to associate it with. And then it decides whether it's going to accept or reject this new information that's coming in. So that's, that's the critical mind. Now, to get back for just a moment to this idea of the positives and negatives in the subconscious mind, in my office I have a fishbowl and that fishbowl has in it a number of stone, polished stones, some of which are white and some of which are black. Now imagine that the white stones are positive experiences and memories and feelings and thoughts. The black stones are those negative experiences and thoughts and feelings. Now when they're mixed together, you know, you can see some black ones and you can see some white ones. But the more black stones that you put in, the more negative experiences that you put into the subconscious mind, the more they begin to predominate, the more they begin to take over, and vice versa. If you have some black, some negative experiences in the subconscious mind, but you load up that subconscious mind with positive experiences, that's a different story. Then the black ones begin to disappear they don't really disappear, they're still there, but they're overwhelmed by the positive experiences. And this is one of the things that we do in hypnosis. When someone has some kind of behavior that they want to change, some kind of negative behavior, 
We help them through hypnosis to imagine positive behaviors, see themselves doing these positive behaviors using their imagination, and we pile these on. We reinforce them over and over again with hypnosis and with self-hypnosis. said earlier that hypnosis is a heightened state of suggestibility that's brought about through a process of relaxation, concentration, and cooperation. Now what do we mean by that? Let's take a look at those three elements, relaxation, concentration, and cooperation. Relaxation through verbal suggestion and usually through a comfortable environment such as a recliner or some other kind of comfortable chair. We help you to physically and mentally relax. We relax you using a soothing tone that helps you to go deeper and deeper into a state of relaxation. Deeper and deeper, the deeper you go, the better you feel. The better you feel, the deeper you go. You see what I mean? It's just verbal suggestion that you are relaxing. So we help to relax your body and we help to relax your mind. That's the first element. Relaxation, concentration. Now when I talk about concentration, concentration is actually a function of the conscious mind. So in the hypnotic process, you really don't have to concentrate for very long. All you really need to do is listen to, this, to the sound of my voice, consciously, for a short period of time while I'm giving you these suggestions for relaxation. But then something's going to happen something's going to happen. You're, there's going to be a shift in your consciousness, so to speak, as you begin to enter what we call the alpha level of consciousness, alpha brain waves. And we'll talk about that more in just a moment. There's going to be a shift. Your conscious mind is going to begin to wander. And when your conscious mind begins to wander, that means that your subconscious mind is becoming more receptive to what's going on. So when that begins to happen, you don't need to concentrate anymore. You don't need to focus your awareness on what I'm saying. You can just let your mind wander. In fact, if you do, and if it does, that's even better. Because at that point in time, I'm no longer talking to your conscious mind. I'm now talking to your subconscious mind. So I want your conscious mind and your critical mind to relax and to be distracted and to go and play over there. Because now I'm talking to your subconscious mind. Now the third element is cooperation. And that's probably in some ways the most important element in hypnosis. Because contrary to popular myths, no one can be made to do something against their will in hypnosis. The cooperation is necessary in order for the hypnotic process to work. And what I mean by cooperation is, for example, when you were young and you were learning how to drive, chances are you were going to a driver ed school or something like that, and at one point or another you were in a car with a driver ed instructor next to you. Now the driver ed instructor next to you would say, take a right over here, take a left over there, I want you to park over here in this space, I want you to stop at this stop sign ahead. Now all the time that person was giving you suggestions. In no way were they controlling you. In no way did they have any kind of power over you. They were simply making suggestions. You were at the wheel. You were the one who was driving. If he said to you, I want you to take a right over here, and you really wanted to take a left, you could. But you didn't because you were cooperating with him. And the reason you were cooperating with him is because you had a goal in mind. And your goal was to get your driver's license. In order to get your driver's license, you had to pass the test. In order to pass the test, you had to pass the class. In order to pass the class, you had to do what the instructor told you to do. So you were cooperating with him. And you were cooperating with the whole process in order to get your driver's license. When you had that test, that written test, you had to cooperate with the test. If you didn't cooperate and you said, well, I'm not going to answer this question because I don't like it or I don't remember it, then you're not going to pass. 
relaxation, concentration, cooperation. That's basically what the hypnotic process is about. Have you ever watched a movie that was very, very exciting? Pulse-pounding action? You could feel your heart beating fast. You could feel the adrenaline surging through your veins because it was so exciting. Have you ever been to a concert or a play in which you really got wrapped up in what was going on? Have you ever read a novel that was very, very sad? You found yourself tearing up. You had a lump in your throat. I'm Ed Schultz, hypnotherapist. And I'd like to welcome you to this tutorial on hypnosis, the subject of which is vivid fantasy equals reality. Now, did you know that the subconscious mind cannot differentiate between vivid fantasy and reality? That's right. In these scenarios that I was telling you about, watching an action movie, reading a sad novel, what's going on is that your subconscious mind is bringing up images, vivid fantasies, of these things that you're seeing on the screen or that you're reading in the book, and it doesn't realize that this is not reality. It doesn't realize that it's just a vivid fantasy. And so it causes your body to do things that it would normally do if this were reality, rather than just vivid fantasy. Now, what I'd like to do is to try a little experiment with you and show you exactly what I mean. Okay? So if you're willing, close your eyes for a moment. Take a deep breath. Just let it out slowly. And relax. Now I'd like you to use your imagination. Just imagine, or visualize, sitting in front of you is a cutting board. In one hand, you have a knife. In the other hand, you have a big, yellow, sour, juicy lemon. You put the lemon down on the cutting board, and imagine that you take the knife and cut that big, yellow, sour, juicy lemon right down the center. Then you push away one part of the big, yellow, sour, juicy lemon. You take the other one in your hand, and you cut off about a quarter inch slice of that big, yellow, sour, juicy lemon. There you go. Now, imagine that you put the other piece down. So right in front of you, in the middle of the cutting board, is a slice of big, yellow, sour, juicy lemon. Then you take your knife and you cut right down the center of that lemon slice, that big yellow sour juicy lemon slice. So now you have two big yellow sour juicy lemon wedges. You take one of those big yellow sour juicy lemon wedges and you bring it up to your mouth, you put it in your mouth, you open your mouth and you bite down onto that big, yellow, sour, juicy lemon wedge. And you can feel that sour lemon juice squirting inside your mouth, all around your tongue, down your throat. Open your eyes. Now what just happened in your mouth? Chances are you were salivating, maybe your lips were puckering, maybe you were swallowing, maybe you actually remembered the taste of lemon and felt as though you had a real lemon in your mouth. Did you? No. You, have a, you had a vivid fantasy of a big, yellow, sour, juicy lemon, which your subconscious mind took to be reality. And so it caused your body to do the things that it normally does when you have a real lemon in your mouth. 
Now, if I had said to you five minutes ago, I'd like you to salivate for me, chances are you couldn't have done that. So what we did is to have you close your eyes, just relax a little bit, and then create a vivid fantasy of a big, yellow, sour, juicy lemon, which you put in your mouth. And because your subconscious mind took this to be reality, it told your body what to do. Now we use this principle of vivid fantasy equals reality in hypnotherapy all the time. For example, let's say that you happen to be overweight. And because you're overweight, you have an image of yourself in your subconscious mind as being an overweight person. Through hypnosis, we change that self-image. You see yourself as being happy and healthy, slim and trim, and we reinforce that image over and over again through hypnosis and through self-hypnosis. And as we do, then your subconscious mind begins to believe, this is my reality. This is true for me. And if that's true for me, then I'm going to cause my body to do what it needs to do in order to conform with that image. We can use it in fears and phobias, too. Let's say, for example, that you have a fear of dogs. Okay? Your subconscious mind has this deeply rooted inside. So what we do is to help you to create vivid fantasy of yourself feeling comfortable with a dog, feeling totally at ease. And the more we reinforce this, the more your subconscious mind believes this is the reality now and then you're able to act on that reality. So this is one of the most important principles that we use in many different ways in hypnotherapy. Vivid fantasy equals reality. If you are able to conceive it and believe it, you can achieve it. Thank you for joining me for this tutorial and I hope you'll stay tuned for more. People often ask me how I became interested in hypnosis. Well, when I was about 11 years old, there used to be a number of television programs that would occasionally tell stories about hypnosis, and that kind of piqued my curiosity. My hobby at the time was magic, pulling rabbits out of hats, doing card tricks, that sort of thing. And in one of the mail order catalogs that I had, from a magic company in Illinois, there was a booklet featured called 25 Lessons in Hypnotism for 25 cents. So I bought it. I read it from cover to cover and I was really intrigued by what you could do with hypnosis. So I called my best friend, Stephen, asked him to come over to the house and I said, Stephen, would you be willing to be my first subject? I want to try to hypnotize someone. And of course he said yes. So I sat him down, I went through the technique that was outlined in the book, told him he was getting very sleepy, his eyelids were getting very heavy, all of that sort of thing. And after a while he seemed to be very relaxed and comfortable and seemed to be in a hypnotic state. So I had three tests that I was prepared to do that I had read about in the book and that I had seen on TV. Test number one, which is pretty traditional, uh, I told him that his, I put his arm up like this and I said to him, your arm is stiff and rigid as a board. This is known as arm levitation. Stiff and rigid as a board, there's no way that you can move it, no matter how hard you try. The harder you try, the harder it is to move. And I pushed down like this and I pushed like that and his arm didn't move. <clears throat> well, I thought that was pretty good. I thought, well... Maybe he's hypnotized, but then again, he was my friend, so maybe he was just faking it. I was ready with test number two. I said, Stephen, it's a very hot day. It's in the middle of the summer, and you're very, very thirsty. So I gave him a glass, and I said, this glass is filled with ice-cold Coke. 
drink it down, Stephen, and enjoy. So he took the glass and he drank it down all the way down, licked his lips, and he was satisfied. Now the thing is, I told him that this was Coca-Cola, but it wasn't. It was vinegar. And when I saw that Stephen would drink a glass full of vinegar, I mean, we're talking an eight ounce glass, but he would drink that glass full of vinegar and not cringe and make all kinds of faces, I said to myself, hey, this is not something that even my best friend would fake. But there was still a shred of doubt in my mind. So I was ready with test number three. And I said to Stephen, Stephen, now as I was saying this, I was doing something, which I'll explain in just a moment, but his eyes were closed and he didn't know what I was doing. Okay, I said, Stephen, hold out your hand. Now your hand is numb. You have no feeling whatsoever in your hand. And as I was saying this to him, and I kept giving him suggestions that there was no feeling in his hand whatsoever, I took some of the skin from the back of his hand and pulled it up just like this. Then I had a safety pin. And I plunged that safety pin, as I was telling him that his hand had no feeling whatsoever, I plunged that safety pin through the skin in the back of his hand. He didn't wince. He didn't blink, even though his eyes were closed. And I thought, wow, hypnosis is really powerful. This is something that today we call glove anesthesia. He didn't make any kind of motion at all, didn't feel that that, that was causing him any pain. There was no bleeding whatsoever. Of course, then I took the needle, the pin, safety pin, out of his hand, told him that the feeling in his hand was normal, and he was fine after that. So when I went through that experience and I tried those three different tests, that proved to me at a very young age how powerful hypnosis can be. A couple of years after that, uh, I met a stage hypnotist by the name of E.G. Matthews, who became my mentor for a while, and I learned a great deal, especially about stage hypnosis, from him. But then after a while, you know, I began to think back to my experience with Stephen. And I thought to myself, you know, stage hypnosis can be a lot of fun, but when I saw the power in terms of stopping the pain, stopping the bleeding, um, I thought, this is, a, this is a power that can really be used for good. Now, when I say power, I'm not talking about a power that I had over him, but the power that his own subconscious mind had to control his body. And so several years after that, uh, in various contexts, I began to do hypnotherapy. I worked with people who had a fear of dentists. I worked with people who wanted to lose weight people who wanted to stop smoking, and people who had been suffering from a lot of trauma in their past. And I found exactly how powerful a tool hypnosis and self-hypnosis could be. And so to this very day, I continue to use hypnosis to help people to release the power within them, to help them to realize what resources they have in their own subconscious mind that they can use to help themselves change or improve just about any kind of behavior. So my journey has taken me from a very simple experiment with a best friend to today, when I'm working with many, many people from different walks of life, different ages, with different issues, all of which can be addressed very well, very effectively, with hypnosis and self-hypnosis.